And welcome, Cassie. Thank you so much for being here to talk about design principles. I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to you, and we'll moderate the chat box for you and, uh, and feed you any questions. Okay, perfect. All right. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to go ahead. Um, I did put together a slide deck here. So see if I can figure out how to share my screen. Maybe? No? It says host disabled participant screen sharing. I'm think, trying to add you as a co-host. Yeah, Cassie okay. did sign into her account. Um, she just joined by clicking on the link, I'm assuming. She's listed um, on my list as a, a guest. I don't have the option on my account to add her as a co-host, so that might be the problem. One second, I will try. Amy, Amy Kay, you're the host host. Can you um, yep. by chance I upgrade Cassie? I did. I did. Yeah? So you should be able to share now. Okay. All right. Okay. Can everybody see that? Yeah? Okay, perfect. All right. Um, so for those of you um, who don't know where we're on the last week's session, um, I am the 4-H Youth Development Educator in Shelby County, um, but I have a professional background in graphic design um, and branding. Um, I, both my degrees are um, agricultural communication degrees, um, and I worked in the communication and marketing advertising sector um, for several years before I decided to go into education. Um, and primarily, mostly, um, I still love doing graphic design. Um, it's something that I actually, um, I always tell people, lots of people will run or read a book, right, or have these side hobbies. So I'm kind of a design geek and I still do design on the side and things like that. Um, but I really missed engaging with people. Um, and I got kind of tired of sitting behind my computer eight hours a day, which is kind of what designers do. So um, I'm super humbled to be here and super excited. Um, to share what I know. I don't believe I'm an expert on any of this by any means, so please don't think that, um, but I do have some background in it, and I hope that I can help you guys understand why um, we do what we do here at Ohio State. Um, so just a couple terms that I'm going to throw out there for you. Um, first off, visual communication um, is the transmission of information ideas using symbols and imagery. And the reason visual communication is so important in our world or our society is because it's oftentimes a universal um, language. So we talk about how um, people speak Spanish or por Portuguese. Um, so not everyone can understand those languages, but everybody knows what a stop sign is or that the color red represents stop or hot. Um, those are things that are um, kind of consistent across all of our different cultures. And so um, visual communication is one way that we can communicate with everyone, um, not just with people who maybe know what our day-to-day -day is or our language. Um, and then graphic design is the art of taking visual communication pieces and combining them um, to convey information to an audience, um, especially um, to produce a specific effect. So graphic design is a conscious and purposeful um, uh, type of art that is done with an intent. It is not arbitrary. It's not like fine art where people are um, just kind of going in and doing whatever, you know, comes to mind. Um, a lot of people will say to me, well, I don't have a design eye. Um, I always tell them um, it's not necessarily about the design eye. It's more about the science because it's much, graphic design is much more a science than it is an art. Um, graphic design is a billion dollar industry. Procter & Gamble, their advertising bu budget a year is $6.751 billion um, just for advertising. Um, there are actual an people um, called consumer, be consumer behavior analysts who study us and target our marketing to change our behaviors and they use graphic design to do that. So um, if you ever hear, you know, talk about big brother, well, graphic design is one of the ways that we have that big brother in our life. Um, and so I just have a quote here from Procter & Gamble CEO David Taylor that, you know, they're reinventing brand building um, from mass marketing to mass one-on-one -on -one branding and kind of that's kind of what we're doing today. 
Um, so it used to be that Ohio State just had a brand and it was kind of like, okay, we'll worry about the marketing and communications team, you know, using the brand. But as we get more into um, society and people are inundated with all types of marketing and advertising through social media um, and digital engagement, some of the stuff that we talked about yesterday, um, what we find is that there's an actual need to be even more purpose purposeful in our marketing and to actually target it to our audiences specifically. And so that's kind of why we're here today because instead of the old school way, which when I was an, um, an undergrad, we had communications tech or comm tech um, and they designed a lot of the stuff for Ohio State. What we're finding now is because of the need to tailor everything specifically to our counties or our program areas, educators, are being asked to be more knowledgeable and to be able to produce some of their own stuff because they're the ones who know their audiences more so than people sitting at you know state offices in Columbus. And so it becomes really important for us to know how to do these kinds of things. Um, everything that we do in graphic design um, has uh, an ability to influence the message you're trying to get across. So every color that you pick, every shape, every line, every decision you make in terms of alignment or the graphics that you use, um, they affect your design. So like I said, I always tell people it is not arbitrary. It is not just, oh, well, this looks pretty. So that's why I did it. There's an actual reason why you did everything that you did. Um, it's very research and scientific based. Um, a lot of it is about readability and leading the eye. Um, so we want to make sure that one, things are readable, that people can take it in, digest it, understand what it says. And then two, that we lead their eye that way. So it's attractive um, and it tells them, okay, this is what I need to read first and this is what I read to, need to read next and so on and so forth. Um, again, people who don't feel like they have a creative eye. So if any of you are going, yeah, right, I'm not artistic. I don't have a creative eye. I don't have the ability to do this. Learning design um, has as much to do with psychology and user behavior as it does creativity. So if you can start to understand the psychology behind the design and where the principles come from, um, you can start to um, actually be a pretty good graphic designer. And I have a link here that I will also share out um, with Danae so that she can put it out there. But there's a really nice blog um, that actually, let's see, can you guys see that? Yeah, okay. Um, so this, um, these, this blog actually will walk you through this. If you're really, if you're really interested in the science and you want something just a evening read, um, this blog does a nice um, job of kind of mapping out that psychology um, and the scientific, me the methodology and the research that has went into psychology um, and graphic design. It has some awesome videos. So like like I said, if you're a design geek like me and you find that that's something that intrigues you, it's a pretty good evening read. Um, and I can share that link out as well. Can you put that so, in the chat box or will it? I can. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I'm, I'm a new Zoomie, so I'm trying to get fancy, learn how to do all this fancy stuff. Um, let's see here. How do I get back to the chat box? If you hover over your top sort of bar in the screen share, the option to should be like view. Oh, yes. You know, it's up there someplace. Do I have to stop share? Oh, there it is. I think it's like under more and then you should be able oh. to pop open chat. Thank you. You guys are so helpful for us. <laughs> See, I'm a graphic designer and I don't even know how to use Zoom. <laughs> There's a lot to learn. Yep. All right. Okay, so there's that link, and I think that's a pretty good read for those of you, you know, I didn't want to spend too much time talking about that, but it is really interesting and something that might be helpful to you um, when you're designing to kind of have that background. All right, so there's lots of design principles out there, and if you Google design principles, some people have 17, some people have seven, some people have 20, it just depends on kind of where they're coming from, but for me, there's four major design principles that then kind of have all the other ones that people talk about as subcategories. So um, the easiest way to remember them, the acronym, I know it's crazy, is C-R-A-P, 
which is crap. Um, but that helps you to understand it's something that you will remember, right? Because the psychology is, is if we can break things down in acronyms, things like that will remember. Um, so C-R-A-P. I'm not necessarily going to go through them in that order. I'm actually going to end with repetition because repetition um, transfers really well into um, branding. And I wanted to end my presentation talking about branding. Please don't freak out. It's not a bad word. It's not a bad thing. Um, it's really important that we know and understand branding and why we do what we do. So I'm gonna start with contrast. So contrast also includes color. Um, so it's the two C's. It is the most effective way to add visual interest to your design, um, but it has to be strong to be effective. And I'm gonna show you real world examples in all cases for the design, because I think that's the most effective is for you guys to see real world examples of how this works. Um, if two elements are sort of different, but not really, it actually creates a visual conflict. So if there's not enough contrast there, there's a visual conflict where our brain can't decide what to look at first. Um, if you make them different enough um, that you have, you, or you can make them different enough that you have contrast, but then you can also make them too different, which also creates an interference because our brain will tell us that those two things do not belong together if they are too different. So it's done in a lot of different ways. Um, there's a spectrum of contrast for sure. Sometimes it's hard to find that balance. Um, you'll see in the top left hand corner, the Buffalo Wings um, Beer and More image. We see this a lot with people putting typography or text over images. Um, in some cases it's effective, in other cases it's not. So in this case, um, from a good design principle standpoint, this is not an effective use of typography over imagery. It's very difficult to read. Um, the best kinds of images that work with typography are images that are very subtle or lack a lot of detail. So you think of clouds in the sky, how it's pretty much white, blue, and it's relatively, um, not, there's not a lot of detail of a picture of clouds in the sky. Those types of images are gonna be better for typography to be on top of them, as opposed to something that has a lot of detail and a lot of color and contrast. Um, it just makes it hard to read um, and it's not attractive. Um, it, there's so much going on. So your brain is trying to process what is in the image. Your brain is also trying to process what the words are telling you. And so it creates a conflict. In the bottom right hand corner, um, you'll see where we have too much contrast. So where I said, it's, you start to feel like your brain tells you these things don't belong in the same category. So on the left hand side, they've used green, red, and blue text um, to create contrast. But because there's so many colors, again, my brain tells me the first paragraph has to be different than the second paragraph, and the second paragraph has to be different than the third paragraph because of the colors as opposed to the one on the right, which uses effective contrast, the colors set off kind of the title of what each of those paragraphs is gonna talk about, um, but it still tells me that all three of those paragraphs are related. Um, hopefully you guys are seeing those things. It's, this is hard for me because I can't see your faces, so I wanna make sure you're seeing everything and it's working. Um, the other thing is to think about what colors that you put together. Um, it can be very um, kind of shocking when you see certain colors together. And I see these mistakes made a lot um, where people will put like yellow typography on black backgrounds or dark backgrounds or even red and green um, or they don't create enough contrast. So you'll see on the left, that is too much contrast. Our brain says, whoa, what's going on there? It's too bright. Um, not to mention from an from a ADA standpoint or when we talk about equity and accessibility um, with colorblind individuals, they're not going to pick up on um, those words in there because especially if they're red, green, colorblind, um, that's just going to look like a gray square um, and they're not going to be able to tell what that actually says. The one in the middle is not enough contrast. So we can see it, um, but it's not quite there and so it doesn't stand out where the one on the right, the um, darker orange on top of the lighter orange is a good contrast. Um, the other thing we often see, especially when we start talking about Microsoft Word and their awesome effects that they have added, is that people will sometimes use things that um, kind of make it, the documents look a little bit less professional. So you'll see here in the middle, 
Um, avoid using gradients. They're actually not very attractive and not professional when it comes to design. Um, you have to be a pretty good designer to know how to use a gradient effectively. So when you start using things like drop shadows and outlining your text and all that kind of stuff, um, it starts to get very complicated. And so really the simpler you can keep it, the better it is. The more readable it's going to be for a larger audience and the more attractive it's going to be for a larger audience. So unless you're, you know, illustrating a children's book or something, I don't, <laughs> I don't advise, you know, tr trying to overcomplicate things. The color that you pick matters. Um, there's a whole science, there's actually a whole industry that studies um, color and what, what colors represent for us. And so you'll see here, this is kind of just a cool little graphic that I found online where it breaks down logos by color and what, what those colors signify in our mind. So um, believe it or not, if I told you right now to think of McDonald's yellow, you'd be able to think of McDonald's yellow. Um, if I told you to paint your walls in your office John Deere green, you could probably come pretty close to figuring out what color John Deere green was if I took you to Lowe's. Um, and they've proven that even like children, children, little kids, so I have a seven and nine year old at home, if I took them to Lowe's and asked them to pull color swatches for me um, out of the paint section that represented certain brands that they're familiar with, like Lego or Walmart, um, they're able to do that um, because those colors are so significant. And um, this will talk, touch base again on this graphic um, when we get to branding. Um, but colors matter, they make a difference. Um, the other thing is colors matter because they represent a brand. So if I showed you the Ohio State Block O, or even if I showed you this little CFAS bug up here, but it had a blue block behind it, you're gonna say, that's not right. Your brain is immediately gonna say, that's not right. Um, and that's color, that, that's part of brand identity, which like I said, we're gonna talk about, um, but that's why color is important. So making sure you're picking the right colors. All right, is there any questions on contrast or color? Anything in the chat box, Danae? No? Okay, perfect. Nothing in the chat, yeah, nope. I'll just keep plowing ahead. All right, um, so the next one we're gonna talk about is alignment. Um, nothing in design should be placed arbitrarily. Um, all pieces should be connected. Um, that helps things make a cohesive unit. We're gonna talk about the invisible line. So you'll see here I have a blue line across my PowerPoint. I have aligned from the top of my page all the way to the bottom everything on my screen, aside from this little footer down here. Um, believe it or not, that simple line makes a huge difference when it comes to graphic design and especially readability um, and how you lead people's eye. Because um, it basically says, I want you to go from the top to the bottom and all this is connected. All right, um, two different alignments can still make sense. So we'll see this a lot too, and this is kind of a fun little graphic design thing that you can play with. You'll see we have two lines, one on the left and one on the right, and it still works for design. It tells you because of the contrast, which we just talked about, Robert Burns is bold and bigger, so your eye automatically says, I need to read Robert Burns first, read poems and Scots in English second, and then move down to the third, which is the most complete edition available of Scotland's greatest poet. If this were not set up this way, if it weren't designed this way, there's a possibility, let's say all of this were the same size text, that our eye would literally not know where to look first. Um, and so it's all about leading the eye, if you think about that. Um, we teach children to read from left to right from a very young, early age. So again, alignment starts left, it goes right, right? Left to right, um, which is something, like I said, that kids learn from a very young age. So it's in our in our nature to to read things this way the other thing is anything that is misaligned actually creates a focal point so sometimes you do want things to be misaligned but that's because you want them to be a focal point if you don't want them to be a focal point okay, i'm going to talk about that here in just a minute then you want them to be aligned so here on this is kind of similar to like our fact sheets and things that we put out um, we have a sample on the left that um, doesn't necessarily use alignment or it has a center alignment. Um, the headlines are all centered and the text kind of looks like it's just hanging around. I don't know whether to read the paragraph on the left 
at the top first or the paragraph on the right at the top first. I don't know if they're connected. I don't know if that's just somebody accidentally made that headline bigger um, because they weren't paying attention or if that's actually the headline for the whole article as opposed to the one on the right which has a strong alignment all the way down here and then it repeats that alignment here. Um, it looks more professional and more sophisticated. The other thing is we just talked about how taking things out of that alignment actually makes them stand out. You'll see here the headline actually crosses all the way across both columns. So the headline is not necessarily in that alignment, which makes it stand out. So now I know violate huskings and you'll, so just so you know, the weird wording, that's something in InDesign where you can just tell it to autofill text and it'll put weird words in there for you so that you can play around with design. So that's why some of the stuff is really weird. Like, where did you come up with those words? Um, that's where that came from. Um, but when we, when and if you sit in on my InDesign session on Thursday, we'll talk a lot about alignment because InDesign has um, what we call those invisible lines. They're called guides and it allows us to draw those guides out so that we can make sure all of our design aligns and then, and they, and you don't have to delete them. They don't print on your design. So it's pretty awesome. So we'll talk a lot about alignment then. Proximity is when we group related items together. Obviously, uh, human nature is that groups imply relationships and space implies no relationships. So this is something that's more of an unconscious processing. It helps with intellectual and visual organization. And just so you guys know, if it hurts to read it, they won't. So in today's, like I said, super engaged, um, super crazy world in terms of everything that's being thrown at us and you know, all the Facebook and Twitter and um, even just TV and advertisements. Um, people do not have time to read things that hurt. <laughs> so if it is complicated, they literally just write it off. They're like, I don't have time to read this. So, so the easier you can make it to read and consume, the better your art odds are that they're actually going to read it. Um, for my picture on the left, you'll see the list is my flowers. But when you indent carnation, primrose, violets, and pink, suddenly your brain says those are separate. Why are they separate? What makes them separate? Are they a subcategory of cowslip? Are they not her flowers? Because her flowers are all aligned up at the top. And so you'll see if you actually sit and look at those, it will, your brain will actually switch to say, wait, those are grouped separately. So why are they grouped separately? Um, on the right hand side, you'll see a business card um, where excuse me, the designer has done a somewhat poor job on the top of leading the eye. So we know that Mermaid Tavern is what we need to read first because of the contrast, but beyond that, you don't know where to go next. I mean, if you could automatically jump to left, right, which would mean you would go to the name number and then down, um, street and then um, city and state, um, but that's not how we read addresses. We don't read addresses with city and state separate from the street address. And so in the bottom, once we've aligned everything, even with a center alignment, and we've set the proximity that you need to read this Mermaid Tavern first, and then the name, and then we've put the address and phone number all in proximity, it makes it much easier to read. Okay. So same thing here, just some more examples. The one on the left, it's got all the information there. Um, it's not that it doesn't have the information, it's just very difficult to read as opposed to the one on the right, which has taken everything, put it in a proximity that makes visual sense, um, that is easier for people to read, has some contrast, has some alignment that sets it off, um, gives it some negative space, which is important. We're going to talk about that here in a little bit too. There's lots of white space out here. Sometimes people have a tendency to want to pack everything in and they don't want any white space because they think, oh, if it looks fuller, then it's better or, I've, you know, filled the page. Um, but believe it or not, that actually can make people claustrophobic or feel a sense of stress um, because it's just like there's so many words on the page and they're jumping everywhere and they don't know where to look first. So white space is a good thing. Don't freak out about margins and columns and things like that. Our brain likes those things. Um, and then on the web. So here's an example on the web of what proximity looks like. I know some of us have cringed a little bit at our own websites for CFAES and um, they do need some work, but 
Um, one thing that they do do a good job of is proximity. These aren't the CFAS websites, but our, as you may know, our CFAS websites have the menu on the side, which helps categorize the program areas. So if you just have everything at the top and you, you they, nobody knows where anything is um, because this is all just kind of gets lost. So having it nice, and again, you'll see the alignment, contrast, which we just talked about. So you have your headers here in purple and then the orange. Those are nice color combinations that work well because those are um, complementary colors. All right, so we're gonna talk a little bit about white space, proper use of white space. And some people will call it negative space. Um, you just hear it called different things depending on different designers and then using columns and margins effectively. So again, talking about having a margin all the way around is really important. I would rather a document be two or three pages long and have proper spacing than trying to fit it all on one page and not be able to read it well. Um, because when you put something, these, this is literally the same exact stuff, same, almost same exact design, but when you cramp it in here like this, it, it subconsciously gives people a feeling of anxiety or like there's not enough room. Um, they feel like they have to read it faster so they don't consume it as much because they don't take time. Um, like I said, entire psychology behind why it's important to have good white space. So again, another sample, when we push things right to the edge, it's bad for two reasons. One, because it's just bad, it's poor graphic design principles, but two, when we print things and they're right to the edge, especially if you're printing things at a press, when they cut it down, they have the, the, they run the risk of actually cutting into the design itself. So it's important to have good margins here. Um, good space between your columns, right? You don't want words almost overlapping into other columns. Um, space between your headlines. So hopefully you guys can see how much easier the one on the right would be to read than the one on the left. All right, typography refers to the fonts that we use. So um, you might hear some people talk about serif versus sans serif fonts. Um, serif fonts have feet on them. You'll see here the feet are highlighted in yellow. Um, what those feet do is they actually make fonts more readable. Um, the feet help our brain. They kind of lead each letter into the next letter. Um, so the little feet, I should be better at explaining this, but <laughs> there's a psychology behind these little feet, which are called serifs, which make it so that our, it, our eye actually leads from A to B to C a little bit better than a sans serif font. So we always recommend that the body copy in your text, so if you're doing a fact sheet or you're typing a letter um, or anything of that nature, that the body copy, so the paragraphs, the, the wordy part of your design is in a serif font because those are the things that you want people to read and they'll actually read it more fluidly if it's a serif font as opposed to a sans serif font. Um, from Ohio State's brand standpoint, they allow us to use, a, if you're following within the brand, um, they have a serif font and a sans serif font. The serif font is Capita and the sans serif font is Proxima Nova. And we're gonna talk about where you can get those or find those fonts here in just a little bit. Um, sans serif fonts, which are the ones without the feet, are good for headlines. So these are going to be your headline text or um, kind of like here I have at the top with my sans serif. These are things that stand out. They're a little bit more bold and they actually, with sans serif, it slows people down, which is something that you want for headlines. You want them to read a little bit more slowly where when they're in the body copy, you want them to read more fluidly. Um, same thing with our boldness of our type from ultra light all the way down to heavy. Um, the heavier the font, the slower people read. It slows them down. So if you want them to slow down, you want them to take their time and read it, you want to emphasize something, that's when you bold things. You don't want an entire paragraph bolded or an entire paragraph heavy because that means it's gonna take them a really long time to read it and they're gonna quit reading it. Cause again, back to if it hurts to read it, they're not gonna read it. If it's taking too much time and they don't have time in their day to read it, they're not gonna read it. So making it um, a serif font that's in a regular um, uh, text weight is gonna make it so that's the easiest thing that people can read. And then with capital letters, same thing. Um, 
our brains are um, wired to read lowercase better than all caps or uppercase. Um, uppercase indica indicates to us that we need to slow down or that it's something that's being called out. And so we um, have a tendency to slow those down. So you don't wanna write all in uppercase either because it also emphasizes emotion. Um, so there's lots of um, emotion and psychology behind uppercase is screaming at me or bold is screaming at me. Um, and so that's not what you want either. Okay, so you'll see on the left, much easier to read. This is still a sans serif, so you can use sans serif in paragraph text if you want to, um, but I, I recommend serif, especially when you're getting into lengthy, lengthy documents. So some people will be like, oh, this is a cool font, I wanna use it, and then they'll use it, um, but it's not great for when it's in paragraphs. So if you find a cool font and you wanna use it, I, I suggest that you use it as something that is good contrast in your design. So either a call out or a headline or something where you're just gonna have a couple words in that crazy font. Um, so if, if you decided that that's something that you want to do that you're designing, now if you're designing something for Ohio State, you're gonna use the brand fonts because that's what Ohio State wants us to do. And then talk, let's just talk a little bit about spacing. Um, so when, again, when you start to space things out too much, like we have here in the middle, our brain says those aren't in proximity, are they separate? Is there a reason that they're separate? Um, if it's too close, it feels cramped and it actually gives us that feeling of, of being cramped. And then if it's, it's good spacing, it's easy to read, it's legible, it's readable, which is what we want. All right, I'm gonna transition into repetition and brand and talk a lot about branding. Is there any questions, Danae? Nope, okay, perfect. All right. Okay, so repetition um, is one of the design principles and what it does is it adds consistency which results in recognition which leads to brand identity. Um, so you'll see here, once you start to repeat something over and over and over again, um, people start to recognize it and it makes it consistent across um, everything that you do. So like I said earlier, McDonald's, McDonald's yellow, you know what McDonald's yellow is, you know what McDonald's logo is, you know what their brand stands for, you know that they have hamburgers and chicken nuggets and that they're a fast food restaurant. Um, this is something that you know and is kind of in our brains because of the brand identity behind McDonald's. Um, there's all lots of brands um, and brands are what sells products. And so sometimes what I encourage people to do is think of, think from a customer service standpoint for Ohio State, we kind of are selling a product. Um, we're selling the services that we provide and we have um, a, I guess, responsibility and role to market those services um, and to do it in a way that puts us above any of our competitors. And I know that that's a corporatized mentality for people who work in nonprofits and um, are very human, um, humanities oriented, um, but it is something that we have to think about, especially as the world becomes more competitive and there's a lot more things out there that are competing for people's attention is how do we get one foot in front of, front of another um, so that we can, um, you know, be, be the front runner in terms of extension programming, youth development, and our services, all those kinds of things. Um, so you'll see here, repetition does not have to be the same design over and over. There are ways that you can take elements of design and repeat them throughout. Um, so for example, here, um, they have the white tractors on a yellow background, but then when they needed letterhead, because you wouldn't want your letterhead to be yellow, um, they, they changed that element so it's still here, um, but they made the tractors yellow on a white background so that they can make the letterhead effective for them. Um, and then they've continued that same kind of um, silhouette, I guess, um, in all their design. In the bottom right hand corner, um, they've taken that black and white pattern um, or the idea behind the black and white and they've repeated it over all their elements, but the design is, the pattern is actually different um, in each one, but it still gives you a sense of, of repetition and a sense of unity among all the items. So again, we do this because we wanna differentiate our product um, from our competitors. competitors. So repetition leads to recognition, which leads to brand. 
So the more often that people see it, the more easily they'll recognize it. And at that point, we've developed a brand. Um, Ohio State, like I said, kind of has always had a branding protocol, but as you guys know, they're pushing it more now than they ever have. Um, I know during the strategic engagement yesterday, Danae talked a lot about social media and how you have to apply now to get a social media account and all those kinds of things. And I know that some people feel like that's, it's a burden um, for the university to kind of have all these steps in place for us to do these things. Um, but the reality is, is there's an importance behind it, a, a significant importance behind it, because what they're trying to do is they're trying to create that recognition or that repetition, sorry. They're trying to get the repetition going so that people start to recognize it. So instead of recognizing things as, um, as individual units, um, people will start to recognize it at, recognize CFAS and OSU extension as something that is a service that is provided in all 88 counties in the state of Ohio and that we are a network of individuals who all work together, which is something that we know, but not always something that our audience knows. And the university recognizes that as a disconnect. And so that's why they've started to kind of develop these brand guidelines and are really pushing branding. And like I said, I know sometimes it can be a hassle, um, but in the end, it, there is a reason behind it and um, kind of why they want to, to do this. Um, there's two words. There's salience, which is an awareness of the brand and its desirable attributes, and then there's brand equity. So there's the perception that your good or service is different or better than a competitor. Um, so there's people who think that Ford is better than Chevy or Mazda is better than Toyota, right? Um, we all have some sort of brand preference in terms of what we wear or use, even down to your laundry detergent and your dish soap or your um, where you, your dog food that you buy. Things that really, really, when you sit down and think about it, why do you buy what you buy? A lot of the times people can't even answer that question. They just know this is, I don't know, I bought it one day and now I've just always bought that. Um, sometimes they have specific reasons, but ultimately what happens is people become loyal to your brand. Um, and so what Ohio State's doing by developing these branding guidelines is trying to make our customers or our clientele loyal to us so that they always choose us over another entity that could could potentially provide the same services to us. So you'll see here in this graphic, brand is so much more than graphic design. A lot of people think, oh, it just has to do with the graphic design. It doesn't. It has so much more to do with, with everything. It has to do with who we are, what our mission is, what our customer services that we provide, you know, what our price points are, all those things are what goes into brand. Um, so just kind of touching on where I said, you know, why is branding important? Well, branding is important because it creates that recognition. It creates a trust. So some of us are very brand savvy. We, you know, care to have, you know, this brand over this brand. Some of us don't, some of us buy whatever's on sale and that's okay too. Um, but it's important from a competitor standpoint, for example, Campbell's Soup, that they stand out as, a compared, as compared to like the store brand, right? Um, and you will recognize Campbell's Soup, even if you don't buy Campbell's Soup. That's what's crazy about branding is even if you're not a, a pur purchaser of the products, you recognize the brand. And not only that, but they've also proven that people can recognize logos by only seeing 20% or less of the logo. So they can actually take a logo, show you one fifth of it, and you can guess what that logo is. Um, just because we are so, we're, we're, we're so oriented around visual communication and branding. So when I talk about brand identity, and I've talked about McDonald's yellow and John Deere green, or if you think about Google, we all know what the Google Chrome logo looks like, or what colors Google is, or what their logo looks like, or their G. Um, what does that mean for us? Well, that translates into things like Ohio State Red, right? Scarlet. We all know what color Scarlet is. Um, if I showed you an Ohio State logo and the Scarlet was blue, like I said earlier, the block O was blue, you're going to, somebody, a customer would assume this is false. Like, is this a scam? It's not, nor it's not what it normally is. Like, there's something that stops them from accepting that as a legitimate Ohio State product if it's not the true Scarlet. Um, the block O, we all know we, we could draw the block O, right? <laughs> we could just pencil and paper, get it out and draw it because we know what it looks like. 
if it's skewed, which means it's been made skinny or it's been made wide or the logo has been um, um, changed in shape or color, um, then people start to question why, why is it like that? Is it legitimate? Is it professional? Is it something that I want to be a part of? Um, and those are all just unconscious things that our brains do to us, um, but it's why those things are important. So even like the CFAES bug, it's something that when people start to see it over and over and over again, subconsciously, they don't even know it's there. Like half the time I'll ask people like, did you even notice that was there? No, I never really thought about it, but they'll pick it out. Um, so I've never done this before, but if I, I imagine if I were to show a group of people this presentation and then I were to ask them after the fact to, I, and I gave them a lineup of different CFAES logos or bugs and they all had different fonts or things, more than likely, even though I never pointed it out in the presentation, after the fact, they would be able to pick out which bug was on that presentation. Um, because they're, they're subliminal things that we notice even when we're not consciously um, paying attention to them. And so the number one rule with branding is that branding should be consistent. And that is challenging in the world of extension and with 88 county offices and different educators transitioning all the time. Um, and so how do we create that consistency? So what Ohio State has done is, in, if you are not familiar with these links, I will also share these in the chat box, but Ohio State has, um, Ohio State and CFAS, actually I had these pulled up, um, have created for us brand guideline websites that actually provide us all the information that we need um, in order to use the brand correctly. Um, there is the primary, um, from a color palette perspective, the primary colors, there's secondary colors that we can use, which is where some of the stuff will come from. Um, we're actually going to use the secondary palettes. I'll show you on Thursday when we use InDesign how to install these palettes in your InDesign palette, color palette, so that you always have them um, and you don't have to worry about constantly trying to find them or type them in. Um, there's patterns, there's photography. This is where you can get the fonts that I talked about. Um, so Proxima, um, I might have, to, yeah, Proxima Nova is the sans serif typeface that Ohio State has. And then Capita is the serif. Um, there's all kinds of things here. And then they've created the templates as well. So here's the CFAES brand website, which looks very much, very similar, right? See this? Repetition, right? <laughs> they, they know what they're doing. Um, so we should trust them and listen to them um, as frustrating as it can be sometimes. Um, so again, they've given us elements and things that we can use here. Um, and once we put our trust in the brand and understand um, kind of the science behind why we're doing what we're doing, um, I truly believe that it will have a positive impact on our programming because people will start to recognize that no matter where they are in the state of Ohio, um, they can get exceptional services from extension. So, are there any questions? Danae, do you have anything you want to add or? No, Cassie, this is fantastic. Thank you so much for the snapshot of design and how that fits with our OSU brand. This was really, really great. Um, I will say we, we do tend to see a lot of content, especially on social media, um, where the brand might not be appropriately used. I see a lot of things like skewed logos. Um, and I, I think Cassie makes a really good point for why that sometimes can like le uh, delegitimize a lot of the stuff that we're doing. It, it, you kind of wonder, well, that logo doesn't look quite right. Is this a legitimate resource? Is, that, is this legitimate information? There's, there's a lot of reasons why we've been touting the brand so much as a university over the last couple of years. And it can seem tedious, uh, but it doesn't have to be hard, right? The guidelines are really spelled out for us on the OSU and the CFAES brand guideline sites. If you ever run into questions, feel free to use those as resources. Um, also, don't ever hesitate to reach out to the brand approval team. Um, I think Debbie put in, let's see, Debbie put in the link to the brand guidelines. We will also throw in the email for the CFAES brand approval team. Let me get that in there for you now. That's CFAES underscore BAT for brand approval team at osu.edu. Um, they have been 
so helpful in helping people make sure that their content is well branded. They're pretty responsive to you. Typically I get a response same day when I submit something for approval. So do use them to your advantage. They are here to help us. Um, so with that, we'll open it up for any questions or conversations for Cassie or the LOD unit. And as you're either typing those in or getting ready to unmute, I will say that Cassie will be back with us on Thursday to lead a session on InDesign, Adobe InDesign. So sort of the basics of using that for creating content. And I know we've gotten this request a lot in the past. So I'm really excited to have Cassie back with us for that. Uh, tomorrow's session, we'll do a Facebook 101 course. So some of the basics of using Facebook. Um, and then Friday, Cassie and I will be tag teaming a Canva session on how to use Canva free graphic design tool for creating things like social media graphics. So I will stop talking now and let you all have the floor with questions. I don't really have a question, but I do have an additional resource that people might be interested in. Cassie talked about picking a appropriate colors for color contrast and avoiding that red green situation. Um, so I've posted in the chat box um, this webaim.org contrast checker. So if you're putting together a flyer or something, you can quickly run your colors through this contrast checker to see how well someone with impaired vision might be able to read your content. Um, we don't we don't want to be putting out inaccessible content. Um, so obviously, um, however, we can you know, do these checks easily. So this is a good resource. And um, there's nice definitions on the website to help explain what these different accessibility ratings mean. So feel free to explore that. And even if you just go there and just do some practice colors to see what it does. Um, I encourage you to check it out and just see how you might be able to utilize it. Yeah, Amy, that's really important. My, I actually grew up, my brother is colorblind. And so for me, like, that's something, that's why I brought it up because it's something that I think about. But um, two, I know right now in 4-H, we're dealing with trying to figure out how to get our project books online. And one of the challenges with that is, accessibility and making sure that they're readable and legible to all audiences because it's not something from an online standpoint we've ever had to worry about because they're in print so like i said there's a lot that goes on it's not graphic design is not an arbitrary process and you'll find that the better graphics that you create the the better results you'll have any other questions here And of course, you can always feel free to email us questions. You can post them in the Facebook group, which I'm going to grab the link to that too. We've been touting that. We've had some really good engagement in our Facebook group over the last um, week, week and a half since we really started using it. And you can feel free to use this Facebook group to curate answers to questions that you might have. We've had a couple people um, just ask questions like, hey, what's the best resource to use for XYZ? And then we can sort of curate answers from the entire community. And then the LOD members can also weigh in, but you can get answers from your peers as well and what's worked well for them. In fact, we had some good sharing um, yesterday about a 4-H form that somebody was like, I already have one built in Qualtrics. I can share that with you. And so it, it can kind of reduce the work that you might have to do yourself because we can just use that space to share. Um, so with that, if there's no other questions, the LOD members will stick around for a few minutes. I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording. Uh, thank you everybody for being on. We had a really great group here today, almost 70 people on, and this was wonderful. So thank you again, Cassie, for your time and energy put into this session. We really appreciate it. Hey, Danae, there was a question from Jonathan. 